hope this can be a productive meeting. So uh, we're here to gather public input. This is, Planning Commission isn't really going to be doing any debate in the course of this. It's really to hear your take on the whole situation of the Holy Spoke Solar Project. And um, this is a controversial project locally. We ask everybody to be on your best behavior. This is your meeting. Be civil about it. And everybody will get a chance to speak. So let me give you the, the rules for the evening. It's a forum of, for citizens to share their opinions and information on all sides of the issue. There will be a time limit of two minutes per person for comments. And we have a timekeeper here who will keep track of that. Everyone will be able to speak once until all who wish to speak have been heard. Audience questions will be directed and answered by the Planning Commission members or the panel of experts. Intra-audience discussion or answering of citizen questions from the floor will be prohibited. People will be called on before speaking. Please state your name before presenting your comment. We will alternate between Zoom and in-person attendees. If you are attending on Zoom, please check to see that your sound is working and that you know how to raise your hand to be called on. There will not have a chat function. Please read the information on the town website regarding the Public Utility Commission's timeline and how to make comments to the Public Utilities Commission board going forward. So I'm gonna let me introduce the members of the Planning oh. Commission and they will in turn introduce the panel of experts who are here for the evening. So we have Martha Cornwell, Naomi Miller, where Mike Foley, Rajand, and Nancy Burns. Martha will take over here. Good evening, it's lovely to see everyone and um, such a lovely turnout. I'd like to introduce our panel for the evening. We'd like to welcome Bill Colvin, who is the Executive Director for Bennington County Regional Commission. And to his left, we have Reed Wills. He is the Chief Operating Officer at Sun East Development for Free Point Solar. And on our Zoom tonight, we have Representative David Durfee, Shaftesbury's representative in the House um, of Representatives. And we also have Jim Porter, who is the Director of Public Advocacy at the Vermont Department of Public Service. So thank you so much for being here this evening to help us um, with any questions that might come up from our um, citizens. What we'd like to do um, is to open it up for public comments. If you wouldn't mind, if you'd like to make a comment tonight to line up at the microphone, please remember that you will be called before speaking and to say your name and then make your comments and that we will be um, going back and forth between someone here in the room and then someone on the Zoom, which you'll be seeing up here on the screen. Thank you so much. If you'd like to line up. Here we go. Some people are dying to speak. Somebody in person? Yeah. You're, you're running right. this thing. Yep, I know. Okay, all right. Yeah. Just look at people so, are... All right, sir, if you would like to step forward, please. My name's Dan Rappahan. I'm new to Shaftesbury. I've been in Vermont 42 years. Uh, general contractor, big on solar. I'm doing my... Well, Is that on? turned up very high. Come on, let's have some juice. If you could hold for just a moment, yep. please. Is this one? Okay. So maybe we're gonna just switch this one. Pardon us. Oh, watch out. It's always this way with the damn equipment. It is. This is good practice for our town meeting coming up, so <laughs> we'll get it all worked out before that. Oh, 
we, that, that one's for Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my name's Dan Rappahan. If you I just moved to Shasbury. Closer to the mic. That Dan way Rappahan, would... just moved to Shasbury, 41 years in Peru, Vermont. General contractor, big on solar, doing my second system at my home. But I'm totally against this project, whatever. Um, big systems like this will just decrease the amount that we get paid back from uh, Green Mountain Power, uh, the land erosion, everything else. So you're talking to somebody who's big on solar. But I just want you to know, we could take a little vote here, just so what you're up, up against or not. I'm nay. Let's hear a vote of hands. Who's in favor of this? Who's not in favor? Say no. Raise your hands. Who's in favor? Who's not in favor? Not in favor. Not in favor. No, who's in favor? Sir, sir, sir. I'm sorry. This is really for oh, comment. Okay, this is for this comment. Is contrary to the rules of the meeting. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm just saying so. With the studies and everything else to do, this is big corporation. Big corporations don't work ever. As you see with our government, everything else, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a comment on Zoom, please? No. There are no hands raised for the Zoom? Okay. We'll go on. Oh, the, okay. If you'd like to speak, please. I'm sorry, that's very high. <laughs> My name is PJ DeVito, and I love living in Shaftesbury. I'm not here to dispute the value of solar power. I'm here to dispute a large solar project, which will not leave its energy in our town. I'm here to speak really from the heart. In this climate of greed and what's in it for me, we need more people to speak out for what's good and honest and best for all of us. Whether you are a native Vermonter or a transplant, a lot of us here tonight are here because we love our green mountains, our clean water, our abundant wildlife. In short, our way of life in a beautiful state. And I believe our way of life is much more important than money. I've worked in tourism for Bennington County in the state of Vermont for 20 years. I know tourism. And I know that it is the number, the number two industry in our state. I know why people come here. And it's not to see solar farms on our hillside. There are so, so few special places left in our country. And we're lucky to live in one of them. Let's not allow our, spe our special place to be desecrated. Once that happens, we can't go back. I have friends who've moved to this region because it's happened in their towns. This may sound silly to a lot of you and idealistic to some, especially those in business who care about profit. But I believe that if more people made decisions from the heart, our world would be a much better place. There's plenty of land in Connecticut. This is our home. Don't let another state use us for their own gain. 15 seconds. Don't let our don't let a company take away what we love, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if we can all hold applause, this is not the place for the applause. Um, is there a comment from Zoom? <laughs> There's no hands up on Zoom at the moment? Okay. Sir, if you can come forward. Hello, I'm Jim Poole. Um, my family lives at 708 Holy Smoke. Can you lift up? Sorry. Thank you. My family lives at 708 Holy Smoke. Um, we're the property abutting, abutting directly downhill from the project. Um, I've made comments at all the meetings, so I'm just kind of quickly summarize, you know, things that are concerning to us. Um, first of all, just the view. Um, you know, the size of this project and where it's starting, um, it's proposed to start 250 feet from our house. Um, we live downhill from this project and to mitigate that view is gonna be very difficult. Um, the company did come out and you know, we met with them at our house and they looked at it and th they seem to be in agreement that it's gonna be difficult. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the other thing is just the size of this project, 50,000 panels is what we're hearing. Um, you know, it's clear cutting land, it's clear cutting, you know, uh, you know ground uh, vegetation. Um, there's a lot of water in that area. 
I know because I'm directly downhill. Um, even now with, with the property as it is, um, we receive a lot of runoff. Um, there's springs up there. Um, and one of my major concerns was... <laughs> Can you mute him, please? What, what, one of my major concerns is the environmental studies have been done for the property, but they haven't been done downstream, you know, downhill. Um, you know, there's, there's talk about the, the groundwater, the temperatures being elevated up to 10 degrees. Um, you know, all this water goes right into, into Perrin Creek and goes into Lake Perrin and, 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 and the rivers, you know, putting, putting trout at risk if this is really true. Um, you know, I think I think the studies really need to be to done done to make sure that the the property out around you know this project are, are protected. Um, I'm concerned about our road. Um, the water runoff on that road um, is a challenge. Um, it, it's it's been worked on a lot by the town, and it's a good spot. Um, but if we're having more water go down that road, it's it's you know we're all afraid that it's going to get washed out. Um, so these are all comments that I've made before, and I'm just kind of summarizing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anybody on Zoom, please? Barbara, if you could go ahead and speak, please. Okay. I'm opposed to the construction and installation of a solar array of this epic industrial magnitude in the town of Shaftesbury, Vermont. It does not reflect our fine community in any way whatsoever. None of our neighboring Vermont towns for miles around has such an industrial-sized solar structure supporting an entirely different state. The detrimental ecological impact will be devastating to our flora and fauna and an eyesore to anyone who passes by. Property values will precipitously plummet, certainly not of green endeavor. People come to Vermont for its glorious explosion of color on the Vermont hillsides and roadways. Um, this will be eliminated by this um, industrial structure. I wonder if the company has consulted um, wildlife <coughs> specialists, what they have in store planned, if there is a plot of some sort to destroy the power grid, if they have consulted someone like Liz Putnam from the Student Conservation Corps, if they consulted the Sierra Club. Um, there's nothing like this in the entire state of Vermont, um, we're having a 14-acre installation on 7A that they're working on right now, which is quite a nice seconds. day. If anyone travels on 7A, you can clearly see it. There's a small town on Buck Hill. I mean, solar systems of that magnitude are um, much more acceptable. Okay, sorry, Barbara. Uh, Barbara, thank you so much. That was time. Thank you so much. If you can come forward and just make sure that you're close enough to the mic so that everybody can hear, Hello? please. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> My name is Eleanor Torty. There's a lot of information to put in two minutes. Reuters reported in June and July of 2021 Brazil probes U.S. oil trader Freepoint, an alleged bribery scheme. Both Brazil and U.S. Justice Department investigated Freepoint involvement with Brazilian oil company Petrobras. This activity spanned a seven-year period and was part of a larger in 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 investigation known as Operation Car Wash. Some of your key players, Rodrigo Berkowitz, he was an ex petrol Petro... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's on Zoom. Can you mute them, please? Please okay. continue. Can I continue? Yes. Please. He was an ex uh, Petrobras feud trader, received bribes from Freepoint through middleman Eduardo Inesco for tipping off Freepoint <laughs> competitors' bids to edge them out. Berkowitz pleaded guilty to U.S. charges of conspiracy to commit money laundering and for accepting kickbacks. In search of his sentence, I found a court document, case number 119. The United States of America against Rodrigo Garcia Berkowitz, who is the defendant quoted in this court document, Trading Company 3. 
The identity of which is known to the United States was an oil trading company incorporated in the United States with its principal place in business in Connecticut. Therefore, all relevant times, trading company three, three was a domestic concern, as, is, as the term is used in the, and has a title and a code. Uh, for information, other than Berkowitz, these court documents do not give names, but only refers to people as, for, as people, foreign uh, official, domestic concern, etc., to be known to the United States. So this court document referred to free point commodities as a domestic concern. The other players were Eduardo Inesco, middleman consultant to free point from 2012 to 20 or 2012 to 2018. He was alleged compensated with inflating commissions to cover costs of bribes who passed these kickbacks to Petrobras employees, including Berkowitz. Sorry, he no, is no. now a fugitive. Th thank you so much. Sorry. I will leave this information here for you and also the court document. No, I don't know if that's I think it I think, I think it's well, appropriate well, to use. Thank you. Is there someone on Zoom? Annette? Annette? Annette, could you please speak? You're on. Yes, um, I'm just uh, speaking on a technical issue. Something has happened with the microphone for Zoom. Could you please make, do a sound check and make sure that both of the microphones are working? Because I could barely hear the last speaker. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for that. We're, we're increasing the sound. How is that for you, Annette? Uh, that's fine. Uh, I'll let you know if there's a problem if the next person speaks into the microphone. Oh, okay, thank you. Should we go on to the next person? Mm -hmm. Yep. Ken, if you can come forward, please, and just make sure that you're close to the mics and maybe tip, tip both the of them you down. You guys got these too tall for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Annette, can you hear Ken as he's speaking? Can you just say test, test? Yeah, Ken Harrington? Yep, that's fine. Okay, great. Ken, go ahead. Okay. Um, the town of Bennington has a zone ordinance that covers any solar site over 1,000 square feet. The town, why can't the town of Shaftesbury have it? Uh, you're not protecting the town if we don't have something like that. I'm not opposed to solar. Uh, this is not something that should be allowed in town without a vote by the townspeople. It's just too big an item. Um, you should have the proper drainage for any site like this or any site as far as that goes. Uh, you guys, I know I, I talked to uh, someone and they uh, have a copy of this and Shaftesbury should have it. I went to the September 30th select board meeting and I asked them to put on, to vote against this plan until we had more direction on it and more information. This thing you've got here, you can't see it with a microscope. So you don't have any idea other than 50,000 panels. Um, Anything like I say this big should be put it on a vote by the town. The select board refused to put that on at that time, and that was the last time they could get it on before the March ballot. Um, the planning commission should have that, and uh, let's see. As I say, it should be voted on by the town. Thank you just you. can't let something like this, that big, go without the town voting on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is this on? No. Okay. Just use your big, big voice. <laughs> okay, my big voice. I just wanted to, um, to point out that the legal, in, in response to Mr. Harrington's comment, that the legal timelines for enacting any new bylaws don't leave us uh, time to impact this particular project. Just to sort of factual.
No. Okay, uh, Bill, I didn't know if yeah. you wanted to sure. make any comments in, in response to the question that um, Mr. Harrington brought up. Just sure. thank, thank you. you. Um, thanks very much, Martha. So I feel like I'm in the uh, unfortunate uh, seating situation here. I ju just to be clear, the Re Bennington County Regional Commission is not an advocate for this project. We will not uh, take a position for or against this project. Our role uh, in this project is to evaluate it vis-a-vis -vis the regional energy plan and the regional plan as well as the Shaftesbury Town Plan and make comments in the public comment period of an application just as the town of Shaftesbury will or anybody else. So just to be clear, I am in no way or nor is the regional commission affiliated with the project. We're here at the request of the planning commission to provide information um, to, to the folks of, of the community. Uh, with regard to the question that, that Martha just referenced, uh, the town of Shaftesbury, when it adopted its most recent uh, town plan, uh, made the conscious decision to not include what is known as an enhanced energy section of that plan, which is a really comprehensive process to go through and look at um, the energy usage in three separate areas, thermal, electricity, and transportation, uh, to look at the current use project future use of that energy and then to set targets and goals for uh, reduction of uh, greenhouse gases and other implications of those, um, that energy usage over time. As part of that enhanced energy section, there can be, as Mr. Harrington um, noted, the opportunity to put in place certain siting criteria. Um, and if that happens, in a hearing such as what will occur potentially if this project moves forward at the Public Utility Commission, the concern that the, the input from the town is given what is considered a substantial deference. Without an enhanced energy plan in your town plan, uh, input from the town is given due consideration. And Mr. Porter from the Department of Public Service may wish to um, provide a little more elucidation uh, of that. But to, uh, to the point regarding time, typically to amend a town plan, um, and specifically if we were to include an enhanced energy section, is that if everything goes well, given the time to compile the, the documents, the required public hearings, which would be one at the planning commission level and two at the select board level, all with at least uh, 30 days notice, is at a minimum a six month process. Uh, and as I understand the law, should this permit to, uh, or should the application be filed with the Public Utility Commission before that were to occur, the documents in place at the time of the filing would be the governing documents. So hopefully that helps with regard to um, the explanation of time um, and, and what an enhanced energy section or revisions up to the town plan uh, would mean. Thank you very much for that. Is there someone on Zoom at the moment that would like to speak? Okay. Sue, if you'd like to come forward, please. Hi, can you hear me? My name is Sue Andrews. My husband and I raised our family here in Shaftesbury. We sold our house a year ago and we're building a very small, very energy efficient house in North Bennington. Um, I had come prepared tonight to speak about this project from the public health point of view because that's where my expertise lies. Suffice it to say that seven million people die each year from contamination from um, fossil fuel electric generation. Um, that's more than have died from COVID in the past three years. So this is the kind of fact that isn't in many of our lives, um, but, but it's out there. Seven million people a year die around the world because of pollution from fossil fuel electric generation. Being here has changed my mind about what I want to say. I spend a quite a bit of time preparing some remarks, but I just want to comment on emotion. Um, a number of decades ago, I spent a number of grueling years in graduate school in public policy at the University of California at Berkeley. 
Um, studying policy was interesting. It was interesting to see how our country makes its policy. And we studied, you know, all sorts of things about data compilation, data analysis, econometrics, law, politics, just soup to nuts. What we didn't talk about, and this was back in the 80s, was emotion. And look at what has happened in our country in the last number of decades with regards to emotion. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. So I just want to say that emotion does run high. I want to acknowledge that change is difficult. Um, none of us wants to see our paradise changed. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any folks on Zoom that would like to speak? No raised hands. Okay. Sir, if you'd like to come forward, please. Thank you. Uh, Peter Bosco, I had prepared remarks, but before I was going to come up here, I learned that this is, this is already a done deal, that basically there's no recourse, um, that the state has already determined, decided that this is going to go through. I don't know, think that's how it demands. That's what I was told. Correct me if I'm wrong. Something I, we should I, I think that maybe we'll let you finish okay. and then we My can. First, I have two issues with this project. First of all, it's just grotesque. I mean, 65 football fields, I mean, who, that's sheer lunacy. The only thing this nice gentleman from Solar Energy is interested in is green, but it's not carbon free. And I, I was on the phone with a friend in Connecticut, I was explaining the size of this, the speed of it all, and he said, this, this smacks of corruption. To get back to Nicole's point, this doesn't look good, doesn't have a good look. My other issue is the town of Manchester had this 30-acre proposal back in 2021. The town killed it based on town aesthetic. Town aesthetic is a code word for property values. The property values in these, these people's homes on Holy Smoke Road is going to go down the toilet. Um, I think there should be some kind of legal recourse. I think there's civil action here. I think it should be investigated. This should not go through. This is 100% wrong. It's crazy. Just to say it's green, everybody jumps on the green bandwagon, but it shouldn't be that way. You don't know what you have till it's gone. You, you put up, a, you pave a parking lot, what is it, how's that go? You pave a parking lot and you lose paradise or whatever. That's what's going on here, okay? Just because it's green doesn't mean it's good. There's a lot of detriments to solar panels too. So I'm, I'm a thousand percent against this and it's, this needs to be, Stop. 15 seconds. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, no, no clapping, please. Folks, no clapping. That is not in our rules. Please refrain. This is our town. Yeah, this is our meeting, right? This is our um, I'm wondering if uh, we should ask Jim Porter um, to speak to the issue of at, uh, in what sense this is a done deal at the state level. Because I think he can uh, talk a little bit about the quite important input that citizens can still have. Sure, um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Great. So also with me tonight is Eric Guzman, who is another lawyer at the department. And I believe whenever you guys are ready, he has a, a brief presentation, maybe a PowerPoint to go through that kind of goes through the process. But to, to answer the gentleman's question a moment ago, this Vermont law requires that when somebody wants to cite a project like this, that they provide notice. And they have done that, and so we're in the notice period. So this has not been filed as a petition before the Public Utility Commission yet. So from the state's perspective, I think it's very much not a done deal. The review hasn't even started, and it won't start until um, a petition is filed with the Public Utility Commission. So does that answer that question for you? And would you like for Eric to go through his brief presentation? Would that be helpful to people? Uh, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I guess, yes, uh, we'll take a moment, a break from public comments to have that happen. Eric, are you with us? And Yep. Uh, so, and uh, I'm sorry, it, was it Eric that was going to be coming on? And he just joined us. Uh, okay. Uh, it, this is Eric Guzman. Um, um, so Eric, before you start, if you can just keep this fairly brief because we have folks that are also um, out here making comments and, and needing to make comments, but we'd love to kind of hear the process. Um, and, and I don't know if we're going to be able to let you have access to put up the PowerPoint, but perhaps we might be able to receive that from you and then put it on our town website um, for everybody to, to kind of review and maybe uh, send questions to you if they have them. Yeah, and I, I will keep this brief. Um, uh, so, yeah, the Section 228 process um, is uh, rather extensive and it's somewhat difficult to summarize in just a few uh, brief sentences, but um, I, I do just just to echo uh, Jim Porter's um, statements. This is currently in the uh, advanced notice um, uh, process segment of the uh, Section 248 process. Um, the state agencies in North PUC have, um, you know, made any sort of final decisions on this. Uh, the department, um, you know, has not engaged in its review of this project yet. Um, that will have to uh, take place once the petition is filed. Um, and once the petition is filed, um, a, uh, a hearing officer will be assigned by the Public Utility Commission um, and in this case, we'll essentially go through a full uh, sort of litigation type process um, with opportunity for the regional and um, uh, municipal planning commissions as well as the municipal legislative body um, to participate in the process um, as, a, as a statutory uh, party um, to the proceeding. Um, and the uh, members of the public may also participate uh, in the process through the submission of public comments directly with the commission. Um, we uh, will likely um, request a public hearing and site visit be known for this, so those are additional opportunities for uh, members of the public to, um, to participate. Um, and uh, we all, uh, there's also an opportunity for, um, uh, for example, joining landowners to uh, request intervention um, to become a, a participating party in the commission's proceeding, uh, which grants them the full right um, to engage in uh, an evidentiary hearing, this, uh, a process called discovery, um, uh, cross-examination, um, briefing, and so on. So um, I, I will um, submit the presentation um, uh, to the uh, town uh, planning commission um, in case anyone is interested. I've also included some helpful links um, at the end of that presentation to give more information on it. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. And, and we will put that out on our town website so everyone can see that when we receive it. Yep. And, and just one, one last statement. Um, you know, You're, you we're like making new public comments that are made here. Um, we uh, do really appreciate um, our participation by members of the public because it, uh, public comments, while they cannot be a uh, basis for a decision by the PUC, um, they certainly help the department um, in, in sort of narrowing our scope of um, a focus on what particular issues um, we should be looking at, as well as uh, other state agencies. Um, so uh, your public participation, um, you know, comments that you provide are, are incredibly helpful for us. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Bill has yeah. a comment as well. Uh, Mr. Guzman, I think it might be helpful um, to... Sorry. Mr. Guzman, I think it might be helpful to uh, set expectations by talking about, you know, approximate time frames, understanding that, you know, there's a wide variety of, of factors here, but can you help the community understand about how long, once a filing has occurred, that process might take? Um, yeah, so it is, uh, you know, somewhat difficult to gauge the exact time frame. Uh, once a petition is filed, um, we uh, you know, are essentially uh, engaged in a, a process where um, we set a schedule um, to have all of the uh, uh, you know, the, the process and review that's, that's required um, for Section 248. Um, you know, discovery alone, um, 
which is part of the litigation process, takes uh, you know a couple of months, two to three months uh, in some instances. Um, an evidentiary hearing um, is typically scheduled out, um, you know, in, in most cases four or five uh, months. Um, so, I mean, usually on um, the Section 240 cases, um, depending on the number of issues that are present, um, and then as well as, you know, how many individuals um, or state agencies or interested parties are um, contesting certain aspects of the case. Um, a um, Section 248 uh, final decision, um, you know, could occur uh, months and, you know, possibly, um, you know, a year out from the, you know, final, uh, or from the uh, submission of the petition at, at the beginning. So, um, it's, it's a, uh, you know, given that there, you know, potentially could be um, issues raised with this case, um, you know, we're looking at a, uh, a somewhat extensive process. It's, it's not something that's decided, um, on, you know, quickly and without thought. Thank you very much. Sir, if you'd like to come forward, please, and just raise the mics again. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name's Pete Sternberg. I've been if, a... if you could get closer to the mic. Oop, yep. Okay. Is this better? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, my name's Pete Sternberg. I've lived in Shaftesbury for over 30 years. Um, I have worked in the solar industry for over 10 years. I'm retired now. I uh, wanted to just tell people what I believe about this project. Uh, number one, the planet and our kids desperately need this type of project. Climate change from fossil fuels is real. Uh, number two, the project, as I understand it, can be well hidden. Um, from what I've looked at. Uh, three, if this array were 200 feet from our property, I would not mind. You could not ask for a quieter neighbor and it will not be particularly visible. <coughs> Number four, the risk of fires is minute. Data from Germany and Japan have shown this. Infrared monitoring of the array can further reduce the chance of, of electrical fires. Number five, <clears throat> this will sound odd, but I really don't care where the profit goes so long as it's not to Russia. Uh, <laughs> we, we buy power, power from Hydro Quebec and fuel from Exxon. Our, our Vermont dollars go out of state. <clears throat> Our town and the state and the state will get tax revenue. Um, number six: In a few decades, the land can be returned to farming, if it makes if it makes sense at the time. That's all I had. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Is there any? No, no clapping, please. Is there anybody on Zoom at the moment to speak? Okay. Jesse, if you'd like to come forward, please. Hello, thank you, and I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I appreciate the engagement. I, uh, I'm from Studio Hill Farm at the intersection of Trumbull Hill Road and Holy Smoke. I've also started StopShaftesbrySolar.org. Um, this proposed solar field would forever degrade the view from our farm and from our neighbors to the north. I feel it's a threat to our wildlife, our natural resources, and the way of life in the hills that my wife's family has cherished and fought to protect since 1936. Anyone familiar with the area can tell you that this solar facility will be visible from public places, including the trails to the east at White Rocks and up on Glastonbury, trails to the west in Arlington State Park and West Mountain, and from the north all the way up to Mount Equinox. But more than that, I feel that fear that this project may be the death knell for Vermont farms and our ability to make a living here. We're losing our industries, we're losing small businesses, our small colleges, and as the climate warms, our ski mountains. And though they are struggling, we still have farms and healthy soil, which I would argue is one of our best allies in the fight against climate change. Unfortunately, one of the unintended consequences of Vermont's push for solar energy 
is a land grab by these out-of-state corporations that have the money to buy up whole farms at a time and deploy their solar fields cheaply on land that Vermonters have kept open, productive, and healthy for generations. Our farms are more than just open land they can exploit. State legislators I've, I've spoken with have told me that they, for years, urged towns throughout Vermont to create these enhanced energy plans that were mentioned. Um, Shaftesbury failed to do so in 2019 when it last rewrote the town plan. I'm grateful to Martha and the Planning Commission for starting that process now. A question from Mr. Durfee. As our representative and a citizen of Shaftesbury, and maybe Mr. Porter as well, I wonder if you might be able to help me understand the town's role going forward. We've been told, we've been told repeatedly by the select board that the town is powerless and can do nothing more than recommend the roads are upgraded to accommodate this project. Um, is that correct or are there more, is there more the town and select board can do to protect its citizens from this land grab? Thank you. Thank you. David, if you're on. Please no practice. On either side of this issue. Yes, David, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to say before I respond that it is a little difficult for folks on Zoom to hear um, Bill Colvin, and I think it may just be the mic at his table isn't working as well. The other mic seems to be working quite fine. Uh, my understanding, to, to answer um, Jesse's question, and I will defer to Jim Porter if I'm not correct about this, but my understanding is that the PUC does uh, take into account the, uh, the position that a town might take on a project like this. Uh, I think that Bill Colvin earlier walked us through the uh, implications of a town having enhanced uh, energy or solar plan as part of its town plan, which has where it doesn't have that. Bennington does, and how Bennington does. I think that nevertheless, the PUC does, uh, does take into account the position of the town if it takes a position, but maybe uh, Jim Porter, you could either back me up on that or correct me if I got it wrong. So, and I'm, I may have to defer to Eric, he has litigated these cases more recently than I have. Um, Yes, some of it will depend upon the, the, the town plan and the, the regional plan. And I know in that case, they get substantial deference from the commission. Um, Eric, am I missing anything on that? Um, that that's right. When, when a um, municipal or regional plan is received, the, affirmative determination of energy compliance under um, uh, 24 BSA uh, 4352. Um, that it's afforded substantial deference, which um, means that land conservation measures um, contained within the plan, um, uh, uh, you know, those specific policies are, are applied to, um, uh, to uh, the commission's determination, unless there's a, uh, what the Senate and she says it's a clear convincing demonstration that um, that the uh, that other factors affecting the general good of the state outweigh the application of that land conservation measure. Um, in the case, in the absence of an affirmative determination of energy compliance, uh, the uh, town recommendations, the planning uh, commission's recommendations, as well as the town regional plan, are afforded due consideration, um, which still factors into the commission's analysis, but it's not as um, robust as the uh, uh, substantial deference standard. Um, the commission still um, certainly considers the recommendation of the town plan, uh, in a regional plan, uh, when making this decision under what's called the orderly development of the, uh, of the region uh, criteria. Thank you very much. Um, Reed, I was wondering if you'd like to respond to um, the last gentleman's communications, if there was anything you'd like to add at this moment. Can you hear me? Uh, might have to get pretty close, I think, to the microphone and 
<laughs> work <laughs> keeping Let's things. How's that? Better. Okay, thanks for having us here. Thanks for giving me a chance to speak. Um, you know, I agree 100%. We're in the application phase, so we get a 45 day notice. Um, the 45 day notice typically doesn't go out to the abiding landowners. You know, we, we went ahead and did that because we thought it was important to let everybody know what uh, plan that we have out here. Um, but we gave you a conceptual plan in the absence of having all those studies complete because that's the process that the state of Vermont has. We are now working. We just need to make sure that you're on this one as well. <laughs> I'm sorry, so that the folks on Zoom can hear. Always, yeah. never fails. <laughs> Is this the amateur? Okay. One more time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what we wanted to share was we've begun this process. We put out a conceptual plan. It certainly created a lot of interest in the town a lot of emotion in the town. And, you know, we understand that. And we would ask that you allow the process to continue. A lot of people have questions about wildlife impacts, water impacts. Uh, we believe those will be quite negligible. And, um, you know, I've been working in solar since 2011. Your neighbors to the south of Massachusetts have, you know, Lots and lots of solar projects down there. Uh, even in Bennington County and in Shaftesbury, there's solar projects out there that are not harming the land and will not harm the land. We have no intention to do so. So, um, you know, the process is just getting started. Uh, in our notice to all the abutting landowners, we provided phone number, email address, and we're beginning to engage with some of our, uh, some of the members of the community. Uh, we'll just let you know, we will sit down with everybody. So we understand some people are against the project, maybe they'll always be against the project, but you still may have questions. And if you wanna sit down, myself, my team, are you know very open uh, to try and communicate. And you will see very extensive studies that I believe are gonna address many of the questions that you have, and I believe many of the concerns, uh, such as rising temperatures of water, degradation of land, you know, you're gonna find uh, we're, we're protecting the land, we're putting pollinator habitat in, we're doing things that are good for farming uh, because of the addition of new pollinator habitat. We've been doing that all over the country. So we're very committed to try and work with you. And uh, we appreciate you coming out tonight. Appreciate all the comments on the EPUC website because it lets us know what you're interested in and we're working hard to put information together to address that. Thank you very much. Is there someone on Zoom that would like to chat? Okay. If you'd like to come forward, please. Good evening, my name is Bill Fisk. I'm a 30 some odd year resident of the town of Shaftesbury. And my comments are based upon an article I read uh, in Vermont Digger. So I, to the extent there may be some flaws in the article, I don't take any credit for those. And I apologize if I misstate something. But my first question was when I read the article, how does this help Vermont? You know, we, we understand that uh, this is an opportunity to generate power, but it's quite likely the power I say how I say that. It's probable a power might go out of state. You know, I would think that we would want to have, public, hopefully the Public Utility Commission would require that the power be distributed back to Vermont as a minimum so that we're getting something out of this other than some tax dollars because I think that's very important how that power is used. Uh, and I wonder if the permitting can be conditioned on, the, on that uh, requirement. I know other things have been done in that area. Um, I don't know about the role of the Public Utility Commission versus Act 250, 
but I understand there are Act 250 uh, concerns involved, as they've been expressed by many people here tonight. Uh, the article says that it's prime agricultural land. And if that's the case, then I think the Act 250 requirements have to be very seriously considered. Um, and really, the only other comment I have to all of this is, um, I don't think the, again, the tax revenue stated somewhere in, 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 on a website was about $100,000 a year. Well, that's not insignificant. It, to me, it's not sufficient revenue to, 15 seconds. thank you, not sufficient revenue to um, justify a project on that basis alone. So I think Act 250 is a big consideration. The value of the back to Vermont is a big consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would um, Jim or David like to address the concerns that, that were just brought up by Mr. Fisk or, or Bill potentially about the benefits? I would. Oh, and certainly. Uh, what, right. hold, yeah, again, hold on. hi, if you can hear me, I'm sure, um, and I think Jim is, is uh, with us still as well. The, the, the question about Act 250, Martha, what year? Uh, yep, that can be one of them. What, whichever question you'd like. Yes. Okay, so I think Act 250 has, there are exemptions written into Vermont statute. Act 250 doesn't apply in, uh, to agriculture, for example, to farming. It also doesn't apply to, the, to uh, uh, energy. And Jim will have to step in here because I, I don't want to be too broad or too specific, but I don't think it applies in this case. The EUC uses a different process, um, to Section 248. Um, Jim might be able to explain the details a little bit, but I think it's intended to cover the same environmental concerns that Act 250 covers. Yeah, that's right. You, it's what you said is um, generally correct, but now this, this will go through the 248 process through the Public Utility Commission. And um, many of the criteria are the same, and I don't know if Eric mentioned this. Um, I apologize, we've got a puppy, he's doing it squeak toy right now, so I just got a little bit um, distracted. Um, the Agency of Natural Resources will be a statutory party, and they will look at um, all of the natural environment issues, and then the department has the criteria that it reviews as well. Thank you very much. And Chris, would you? No, I covered it. Okay. Is it possible that Bill would be able to address the issue of the energy going out of the state? Bill, do you have any comments about the energy going out of the state and uh, addressing that in any way? Um, sure. Um, so, um, you know, without question, as we understand, again, there's no formal filing yet at this point, but uh, it appears that a contract may be in place at some point in the future with a Connecticut uh, energy company. You know, it's, it's important to remember that very little of the energy that Vermont utilizes is actually produced in Vermont. We get a, most of our energy, the vast majority of the energy that comes to Vermont comes from other places, other places that are dealing with the impact of the production uh, of that energy. Uh, in this particular case, the energy being produced would go into the New England grid. It's really difficult to track an ion and figure out what exact uh, ions are coming back to Vermont from that grid, um, but it does you know, stay within New England. So there may be additional ways to ensure um, that more of the power produced stays in Vermont, um, but the fact that it goes into the New England grid does in fact benefit uh, all of New England, including Vermont. Thank you. Oh. Read. Uh, just to clarify one key point, uh, Freepoint's a Connecticut-based business. We've never at any time said the power is going to Connecticut. Freepoint Solar is an investment business that uh, is primarily run by people at Sunny's Development, people that work for me. And um, we have not committed to sell the power yet. 
but I thought it's probably worth telling you that a great deal of the renewable power that GMP is now using and distributing was developed uh, in a wind project in northern New Hampshire, Granite Reliable, that was developed by my business partner and, and, a, bit, and a company that he was with previously. So, um, you know, we, we know GMP uh, historically from doing business with them. Uh, we're open to working with GMP. But the reality is, you know, we're trying to get a little further along in the process. I know you all feel like the process is moving very fast. In, re in reality, there's going to be, you know, a lot of these discussions that are going to take place over the next 12 months. And, you know, some of those discussions uh, outside of the agency uh, and PUC will be, you know, discussions with customers. So the power may land here, it may not. It does keep the new technology that comes on, kicks off the old technology that is hurting somebody somewhere. That's for sure. So that oil-fired power, gas-fired power, you know, that's, that's necessary for the grid. But, you know, if we want to reduce that, if we want to have electric vehicles, we want to increase the amount of electricity that we use, and I understand Vermont's very interested in that. New generation that does not have emissions is very helpful in meeting those goals. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. Is there anybody on Zoom that is raising their hands? Okay. Kit, if you'd like to come forward, please. Uh, hi, I'm Kit Auschnitt from Holy Smoke Road. I hope we can agree up front that no one in a rural residential area should be forced to live in the shadow of an industrial power plant. You need only walk the property that Freepoint Solar plans to litter with panels, transformers, a massive substation, roads, and fencing after stripping the fields of prime ag soil, cutting the hedgerows and forest, and demolishing the bird and wildlife habitat to realize the ecological devastation this would bring to Shaftesbury. It's an old lesson we never seem to learn. You can't save the environment by destroying it. The destruction would be a permanent scar on the landscape visible from hiking trails, mountaintops, and state forests. But the panels themselves last only 25 years. Recycling is not trivial, another mess we'd leave to our children. Let's get smarter about solar development or deployment. New commercial and residential development in Vermont consumes 1,500 acres a year. If Vermont required even a fraction to be solar ready, we could be generating hundreds of megawatts with little added disruption. But this proposal is not about clean energy. It's about dirty money. Commodity brokers like Freepoint do not make things, they make deals. They hire out-of-state contractors to do the work. Try keeping track of all those contractors. And try finding free point once the damage is done. As an abutter, I have standing to intervene at the PUC against this proposal. I am told that I may need to bring an attorney and expert witnesses at my own expense to the tune of many thousands of dollars <laughs> to go against pit bull attorneys financed by a wealthy corporation. Fortunately, I am uplifted by the group Thank gathering you. That's through Shaftesbury, time, correct? Shaftesbury Solar. Well, make up your minds. I accept my intervener role. It, I invite you all to time. join This is time. Thank you. Thank you. It, is there anyone on Zoom that would like to speak? Okay. Sir, if you'd like to come forward, please. My name is Gary Burgess. I'm a 42-year resident of Shaftesbury. <clears throat> Lifetime Vermonter. Back in the 60s, Vermont put a billboard ban on their highways. One of the best damn things that ever happened in this state. Route 7 South, US Route 7, limited access federal highway. You're going to be able to see that from that highway. I've driven it. I'm a firefighter. On the plan, there shows a federal a permit onto the property off of a limited access highway. When there's an accident there, 
I'm the one that's going to be standing in the road, putting my life on the line for traffic that does not slow down for fire trucks. How about the heat that's going to generate, be generated from those panels? You've got what, three, four hundred yards wide, six hundred yards long? A bird flying across there. Is he going to make it across? I'd like to know that question. Now, this, this state has been run, this state has been run by out-of-staters for too long. We need to stand up and fight this. And I am with Shaftesbury Solar 100%, and my pocketbook is too. Is there anybody on Zoom at the moment? Okay, thank you. Bill, if you could come forward, please. Thank you. Um, you can hear me okay? Hello, my name is Bill Christian. I, I've lived in Shaftesbury since the 90s, but I recently moved south for the climate to North Bennington. <laughs> I'm a mechanical engineer and I've spent my whole working career reducing energy use. I'm on the North Bennington Shaftesbury Energy Committee. I support this project because it will stop the burning of 270 million cubic feet of natural gas every year. I do not care in even the very slightest who buys the energy or who gets the official renewable credits for it. I care only that we will no longer be burning 270 million cubic feet of natural, fracked natural gas every year. If Connecticut, say, pays for the electricity and gets the credit towards its state goals, I am extremely happy for them. I'm thankful. I don't have $30 million personally to spend on this project, but the, and I'm glad someone does. I'm glad that our laws and our policies have made it profitable. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it, and we would continue to burn that 270 million cubic feet every year. And that would be a tragedy which we can avoid. Um, I don't like to see big corporations coming into town and destroying the mom and pop places, but this does not apply to solar. That just isn't how it works. This solar farm will not put little solar installations out of business. And I very, very much hope that residential and small community solar continues to grow in Shaftesbury at the amazing place that it, at pace that it has, because it is desperately needed as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom that would like to speak? Okay. Bleeker, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bleeker Wheeler, and I'm a resident of Shaftesbury. I live a few miles away from the proposed project. Just have a few ethical questions for the developer as well as ourselves and our legislators as we seek to resolve this. Unless I'm mistaken, I'm pretty sure that, the one, that one of the biggest reasons for renewable energy is saving our planet. If that is the case, why are we cutting down forests, disrupting wetlands, and using prime agricultural land to do this when we have far better off options such as rooftops and deserted gravel pits. On the 5th of January, Mr. Willis was quoted in the Bennington banner as saying, we're here to begin a process of working with this community and state agencies in order to ensure the project we are proposing makes sense and is done the right way. If this is true and they really do have our best interests in mind, I hope they're actually listening to our comments and concerns. Clearly the locals that are most affected by this project are sternly against it, whether for aesthetic or environmental reasons. So how willing are the developers to reconsider this location and or the size of the project? Have they arrived with respect for us and our lands or are they willing to ignore our concerns and sidestep us in order to maximize their profit margins? Can we not work together to figure out a solution that satisfies everyone instead of creating a situation where the locals are left feeling like we're getting the short end of the stick? I understand that in terms of adopting the new energy section into the town plan, time is not on our side, but I hope that we have learned from this experience and that we are now taking the right steps as prudently as possible to do so. More importantly, if the developers actually do want to work with our community, 
Are they going to respect our decisions, albeit late ones, or are they going to strong arm their way into getting what they want? If this property went into contract back in 2017, why did the developer not immediately state their purposes to the abutting neighbors and local community? Why was this project kept under wraps for five years only to finally be revealed just before the recent holidays when a lot of folks aren't even around? It would seem that anyone who truly has the best interest of this community in mind would have extended an introduction to the neighborhood first instead of pressing forward with their plans as far as they could before finally, re finally revealing them in a way that does not feel at all forward and honest to our local community. Thank you. Thank you. Reed, would you like to um, respond to some of those questions? You know, I joined a select board meeting, and I've said that that meeting, and I said uh, here, it's an awful way to talk. <laughs> Usually, it's the sabotage by the vehicle. It happens all the time. Yeah, it always happens. So we did start work on this in 2017. Uh, two years prior to that, this was property that was put out on the market. My understanding is the property received one person who came who had interest in buying the property, and that person came onto the property and didn't make an offer. So we were looking for property here and elsewhere in New England, found a site that, and we've done quite a lot of study on this, you know, we feel can be, uh, you know, located and very hard to see from Route 7, from the neighbors, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to say totally eliminate visual impacts, but quite mitigated. We've spent quite a lot of time uh, studying the natural communities, we work with VHB. They've got 30 professionals, eight environmental scientists. You'll see our work. Um, you know, and as I said, we're going to take care of the land. We're going to put our pollinator habitat in there. And, um, you know, we'd like to, uh, you know, put a project together that the community would be proud of. You're telling, you know, I hear you saying, you know, why don't you take our considerations into mind? What I would ask is this. How about a two-way street? Because I think you folks have some misconceptions about the project. You haven't had a chance to see the detail. And it would be helpful, you know, if you took a look and put an open mind in this. And if you want to work together and have a back and forth, that's something we're interested in. If you want to tell us this is the way it has to be, because we don't like it based on information that you're picking up off the internet, or something you talk to somebody down the street, you know, we've worked hard, we've invested a lot of money, and you know, we have the right, and we've been encouraged by state incentives and by, you know, the local, uh, you know, our understanding of the Bennington Regional Plan that solar would be welcome here. So, you, uh, you have a lot of solar <laughs> in your community, some of which is not shielded at all from view. So, you're, you know, we respect your opinion. I hope you respect the fact you know, you're asking us to think about you and your children. I got three kids. I respect people as well. I have integrity. I've worked to do clean energy projects and clean up the environment for my entire career, which began in 1988. Might not mean anything to the people here, but I'm just telling you. We're trying to do the right thing. If you want to engage, meet in the middle. I yield my last 15 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone on Zoom that would like to speak? 
no hands are raised. Tony, if you'd like to come forward, please. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony D'Onofrio. I have lived in Shaftesbury now for a little over um, 10 years, almost 11 years. I was born in Bennington and raised in Western Massachusetts. A couple of things I just wanted to bring up tonight. I, we, I think we really need to stop talking that we're not going to see this project. I spend a lot of time in the woods that surround Holy Smoke. I drive the roads to this community. I live just a couple miles away. This project's going to be visible no matter what people are saying that it's not going to be. We are going to see this project from many different vantage points throughout the community and the town. Another thing I wanted to bring up, Northwestern Connecticut and Northeastern Connecticut have plenty of agricultural land, plenty of forests. We all know the reason that they're doing this up here is because land value is a lot more in Connecticut. So let's maximize our profit by buying land cheaper in Vermont, building our solar array, and selling it out of state. I mean, you know, I, it's pretty obvious they can get land, that much land, at, for less money than they would in Connecticut. Another thing I wanted to just read real quick from our own town plan. Policy 4 Dot one, dot three, land use proximate to wetlands, streamlands, water bodies and surface and groundwater source protection areas should not be adversely affected, should not adversely affect the quality of surface and groundwater resources. Employ zoning and development review as tools to protect the quality of streams, rivers, water bodies, including riparian wildlife corridors, highest priority surface water, and riparian areas. Map 4.1. Referencing areas shown on maps 4.1, 4.2, the town should ensure new developments avoiding disrupting rare endangered species habitats, deer wintering areas, and habitat for wide ranging animals. Look at map 4.1, that's the entire project. Thank you. Anybody on Zoom yet? Okay. Sir, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Gentlemen, ladies of the board, I was going to ask tonight, uh, what is the disposal plan after these panels run out of their lifespan in 20 years? Are they going to be thrown away into landfills like the rest of them, or will they uh, be recycling, which they are not done yet on an industrial scale like you're planning on implementing? Other thing you said, can you show us the details? You said you'd love to share them with us. Is there some way we can be able to see that as a community here? Furthermore, uh, viability of solar in Vermont, because of Vermont's minimal solar potential because of its high latitude, um, a little bit of background on me, I have a mechanical engineering degree with a focus in power and energy and I took several classes in renewables. Vermont's high latitude makes it much less uh, pristine for solar potential compared to like places like Connecticut or much further places south. Um, but with that, According to weather.us.com, Vermont has 227 cloudy days per year. We have solar panels on our house. They do not produce anything uh, for most of the, like, the time that they were rated for because of the weather that we all live here. Is the weather great? Not always, but we have some good days. Other times, uh, Vermont, we have snow. Snow is great. Snow is not good for solar panels. Um, it took me a week and a half to get the snow completely cleared off the panels then. And in that time, our solar panels produced almost nothing. And that was when the last foot and a half storm came in. But it only took, so from what I've seen in my house, uh, only about four inches for all the power to be stopped completely. And how often do we get four inches of snow? I know this year's a little bit of an exception, but four inches usually isn't that much. And I uh, wanted to say thank you for coming out here and respecting us. I hope we can all respect you as well. But Listen to us. This is our home. This this may not be your home, but this is our home. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to respond? <laughs> Read if you'd like to start. Okay. So a couple of questions. The first one is on uh, disposal. So the you know space program was the first to use solar panels that started in the 50s. So, you know, solar panels will last 50 years. Solar panels 
are manufactured with warranties that go out as far as 30 years. And the warranty says at the end of 30 years, they'll produce 80% of the energy that they did on the first day. So they're not useless at the end of the 25 or 30 years. So what's going to happen at the end of the project? The most likely thing that's going to happen is if the project's getting shut down, the panels would be used by somebody else. They'd be resold. So it's, uh, you know, it's true uh, at some point they're not going to be economically productive. And at that point, they'll be recycling. Recycling is well established in Europe. And the reason it's established in Europe is because Europe started building solar projects a lot sooner than we did. So we don't have as much end of life solar panel to deal with. But that's coming. And that same technology can be used here. So you're looking out 40 to 50 years until it has to be disposed of. And there's recycling potential. The second question was on efficiency, which is interesting because you're talking to me about the fact you got solar on your house. So for everybody to say solar doesn't make sense, but if you drive around Shaftesbury and you see all the solar panels out there, obviously it made sense to some of you. Now, why does it make sense to us? And what's changing? Uh, you said no project has ever been done like this in the state of Vermont. Of course, that's not true. Some of you are fully aware of that. Ludlow, Vermont has a project that is the same capacity as our project, but the difference there was they built on 150 acres. We're building on 85. So the efficiency of the technology has improved enough that we're going to have less impact. Why does that make a difference? Well, a project that's a tenth of our size is going down Cemetery Road, and that's going to use 15 acres. I think that's probably prime ag soil, too. So when you scale up like this, you get some efficiencies. Yes, there's some negative aspects to it. There are some positive aspects to it. But the technology is being used. Obviously, Massachusetts is basically the same latitude. Lots of solar in Massachusetts. We're virtually in Massachusetts. We're a very short drive away. And then the other thing that's changed, other than the efficiency of the panels, is panels used to have aluminum on the back end. And so the solar energy was only coming one way. And of course, when you put it on your house, the same thing is true. Solar energy can only end in one way. About four or five years ago, the technology was introduced to remove that aluminum panel and go glass on glass. The glass is very strong. They take 100 mile an hour softballs and throw it at it, make sure they can withstand hail. And, uh, and, and so what happens now is when it snows, the reflection off of the snow is being captured. So these are called bifacial panels. There's no exotic technology here. All they did was they just put a solar cell on both sides, put glass on it. So now, in areas that do have a lot of snow, there's actually a pickup of, of energy. And of course, if you have some solar energy coming up through reflecting, you're going to melt off of the face of it. So the technology is moving, it is changing. As I said, you know, I've been at this for a little while. Been in this energy industry for over 30 years and been doing solar since 2011. And the improvements in the technology have been great. And they should be demanded to be state of the art, to be in your community, and that's our intention. Thank you. Are there any folks on Zoom that would like to speak? There are not. Okay. Sir, if you'd like to come forward. Hi, everybody. My name is Wayne Goodman. I live in Bennington. Um, I've lived in New England for 30 years. Um, I am an energy professional, mechanical engineering background, been working in energy conservation for most of my adult life. 
starting with deep energy retrofits on residential houses all the way up through solar activity at this, at this level and higher. Um, I'm also the energy chair for the Bennington County Regional Commission Energy Committee, although I, <laughs> I'm sure that my opinions uh, run counter to the BCRC's opinions at this point. I'm here to voice my absolute support for this project. There are only a limited number of times where we're going to have the opportunity to make an impact on our energy consumption and switch it to renewable energy. And this is, in my, in my lifetime up here in, in New England, this is the best project I've seen. And it has to do with the location of the land as it relates to usable infrastructure, three-phase power lines. It has to do with the technology of the solar panels they're using. Uh, I, I do work in the solar industry, and I know that we are now recycling solar panels, although most of you in this room won't believe that. The, um, the bigger question I have is if you turn this down, if it, I mean, well, let me back up and say the one thing I would love to hear that I haven't been hearing as much as I was hoping for is instead of no or hell no, why not you guys say, how, how can we compromise here? Compromise is the whole deal. Because the bottom line is, if this doesn't go through, sooner or later we're going to lose out on other legitimate companies. And do you really want your power all to come from Quebec Hydro all the time? Thank you Thank for you. your comment. Thank you. Do we have any comments on Zoom? I'm sorry? Uh, well, she, oh, yes, and we're going to uh, let Annette speak, even though she spoke before, because she was raising a comment about not being able to hear. So, Annette, can you please speak? Uh, yes, I wanted to offer a clarification. Uh, the man mentioned that the Bennington County Regional Commission is part of So this is about the 20 megawatt solar project in Ludlow. It says project description. The project is a 20 megawatt AC solar electric generation facility that will be sited on approximately 88.5 acres of a larger 155 acre parcel located off Parker Road in Ludlow. Vermont. So the amount of acreage for that 20 megawatt project was a total of 88.5 acres. Thank you, Annette. Carl, if you'd like to come forward, please. Uh, yes, I'm Carl Corman. We've had our home here in Shaftesbury since 1983. Uh, in my former life um, of 35 years, I was legal counsel for the Corps of Engineers. Um, my specialty was environmental and construction law. Um, unfortunately, I've had the, uh, the experience of having to attend many of these types of public hearings, but sitting on the other side of the table. Um, I do not have an opinion yet on whether I support or do not support this. I believe, again, from my experience, the information isn't there to make a decision. Um, I'm looking forward to that information. I'm specifically looking forward to that environmental documentation, because from my experience, Environmental documentation is what everything will turn on. Um, so I, I'm going to assume possibly that this project will go through. And I do have a specific question if it does. Would your contracts include any requirement for prime contractors to let a minimum of subcontracts in the, uh, to contractors or material men here in Shaftesbury or at least in Bennington, Bennington County? And I have an observation. Um, this evening, all of us have been given a lot of information. Mr. Guzman was very, very eloquent in speaking, but I think I'm going to make it a little more specific. It's clear if this goes before, the, when it goes before the PUC, it will be like a trial. And although a lot of pent up feeling has been expressed this evening, um, gut feeling about how we don't want it to be here for some people, that will not carry the day. 
What will carry the day, unfortunately, as a gentleman earlier mentioned, are expert opinions. And expert opinions require, require hiring experts. And to the extent that the entity, the, the company here today, want to do something, they're going to have to get together to form a committee to get those experts and probably lawyers. And I would appreciate the answer to my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're still engineering project. We have not hired anyone uh, to do the construction work, so we can't make any commitments regarding that. Um, there's certainly got to be uh, local benefit and jobs created uh, and associated with the construction and I think that's, uh, you know, great input, input that I can take back and allow us, you know, let's keep that in the front. I think, you know, keep that as a, as a hot topic but allow us to finish engineering it. We haven't gone out to bid, we don't have contractors in front of us yet. And we don't know what the, either the talent pool is here for people who are skilled at that, but we know people are installing solar, so there's definitely, but the other thing is the capacity, right? Is everybody busy doing rooftop? Is everybody busy doing community solar? So uh, what I would ask is keep it in front and we will uh, continue to address that issue. Thank you. Is there anybody on Zoom at the moment? Okay. Karen, if you'd like to come forward. Thanks. Karen Mellinger, my husband and I have lived in Shaftesbury, not too far from the proposed site for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I do want to thank the board and our, the guests for, for presenting to us. It's important for the townspeople to have a chance to take a look at this. Um, a couple of points that I wanted to make. Um, one is I'm sure that you must be aware that the water source for North Bennington, the piping runs underneath that parcel that you're proposing yeah, yeah, to put yeah, these yeah, things yeah. on with heavy equipment. I don't know how you handle all of that, but that's North Bennington's water source right. uh, and the folks in our center Shaftesbury down here. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is that this project, um, my understanding is that our town plan, and I'm sure working with the BCRC, you identified us as having approximately um, 0.96 megawatts in town at this point, um, or close to it. And the goal for 2050 for Shaftesbury is 10 and a half megawatts. So this project, <laughs> if this project went through the way it is proposed, within perhaps two years, we have, we will have reached twice the goal for Shaftesbury that has been set for 2050. Um, to me, that seems an awful lot for the town to bear. Um, and I would strongly urge our planning commission, the select board, to do everything that you can to expedite your work on not allowing something like this to happen again, because I have no doubt that this, these folks did their job as a business. They looked at a small town, they found land, they found the infrastructure, they found the, 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 the lines above it, and they took a look at the town plan and said, hey, it's, it's wide open, we can do whatever we wanna do. So hopefully you will get that started, maybe get it through before six months so this can't come up before us again, and it might be something if that's in place or at least in process that the PUC will take a look at as they review this. So thank you very much. Thank you. There's somebody. I'm sorry, who? David Durfee. Oh, David Durfee, please, on Zoom. Yeah, thank you. thanks, Brian. Um, I want to go back to a comment that Carl made, Carl Bowman made a couple of speakers ago, and again, call on uh, Jim and Eric, who, by the way, I wanted to thank them both for making themselves available tonight to, to join us and 
mentioned that I reached out to somebody in Jim's department Thursday night, it was 9 o'clock at night, and within half an hour they had assembled folks to be here. This was well after hours, so very appreciative of that. Um, I, I think that it's not, it's very confusing for many people at different PCC, Public Utility Commission, and the Department of Public Service. We're getting a little bit of an education tonight. Um, appreciate that. My understanding is that the Department of Public Service, in, in uh, part of its role, is, is representing the public interest in front of the PDC. And again, if I'm speaking, speaking directly, Jim will correct me, but to Carl's point about there being a, uh, something equivalent to a trial where uh, the, the applicant will have its own attorneys, obviously, that the other interests are not necessarily well represented. I, I think that the Department of Public Service um, plays that role, but Jim, if you wouldn't mind clarifying. No, thank you. And once again, you've got that correct. I'm quite sure that um, once this petition for this project comes before the Public Utility Commission, we will hire an aesthetic person and have a review of that done. Um, as far as aesthetics goes, um, our position will become whatever the expert's opinion is once they've reviewed the project and done their report. Um, and you're correct, we represent the public interest, which everybody on this call tonight may have a different view of what the public interest is. And so it is frequently not the most popular job in the state to have. But um, just, yeah, we don't represent any specific interest or any party, but um, you, you'll be seeing more of us, you know, if, if and when this project progresses. Thank you very much. If you want to come forward. Put my glasses on. Hi everyone, my name is Amy Smith. I live in Shaftesbury. Um, a number of my points and questions were actually covered by the gentleman, uh, Bleeker, who spoke a few before me, but um, you mentioned that you are not hurting the land, yet you're clear cutting 30 acres of hillstop forest. So I don't know how that's not hurting the land if you're clear cutting 30 acres of forest and then building this industrial size solar power plant um, on prime agricultural land. My, my biggest question is why can't you use other commercial and industrial sites already available? in Vermont or anywhere else. I mean, there's so much that's already developed in New England. Why are you picking to clear cut and take prime agricultural land? My third one is a question on what your plan is for keeping the grass and field from turning back into shrub and scrub. Um, do you plan to mow the 85 acres on a regular basis or do you plan to use herbicides to keep the grass down? Thanks. Thank Those you. Three. Those are the three. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, cutting trees. So the, the project right now is set up to be on 85 acres. Oh. A closer to the mic, sorry, the other. I want to I look at people and they're on no, tape. If I had like pigeon eyes or frog eyes, I'd do better. I don't know. Um, so I apologize if I'm not looking at anyone directly, but I have to look at the microphone. So uh, on the tree cutting, yes, there is going to be some impact. There are hedgerows there. You know, part of the 30 acres are hedgerows. Uh, that are not is not high quality forest, but we are cutting into some of the uh, forests that are there, and there is some impact on that. Um, and even some folks have brought up the fact, hey, trees sequester carbon, and isn't that you know something we should be thinking about? Bear in mind, we have a, we're going to have an extensive landscape plan, so we are also going to be planting some trees that'll be growing up. 
um, and we are willing and are considering doing some uh, conservation of the, uh, there's about 185 acres there uh, of, of some of the trees that are in forest area that's already there, that is not under a conservation easement. So there are some ways in which we could work together to uh, protect trees and forests. But there is, you know, I agree with you, there is some impact. The um, prime agricultural land. So for the last 20 years, you know, based on what the landowner has told us, um, there's only, you know, other than doing hay, the, they brought in a tenant farmer to try and establish corn, and after two seasons, the tenant farmer gave up. Um, so they're really, it's, uh, we understand there's prime agricultural soils. This hasn't been productive land uh, for food production for quite some time. The land is not gonna be desecrated. There's not gonna be, a, there's gonna be very little grading. So what that means is the soil's gonna stay where it is. Um, the primary impact to the land is we're putting I-beams in the land. And when you put I-beams in the land, that's a pretty small footprint. And that's something that can be removed at the end. That's why there are decommissioning bonds. So that the land, uh, that um, the uh, I-beams can be removed and the copper can be removed and the, the site fully remediated. Um, the last thing I, you know, I'll repeat is, uh, oh, you asked about herbicides, which is a great question. Uh, yeah, we're gonna minimize the use of herbicides and we're gonna really focus. I'm sorry, did someone tell a joke? <laughs> yeah. We don't want any herbicides. So our, our plan, and we're happy to take your input on it, our plan is to do a pollinator habitat on the site. And what you do with the pollinator habitat is you actually, anybody who's done this at their gardens, at the end of the day, there's very little mowing. What you have to do is you have to mow probably five, six times during the year when you're first establishing. And then each subsequent year, the amount of mowing that takes place goes down. Uh, and you know, the, the type of pollinator habitat you put in you know, the goal is to make it shade resistant so it will grow and thrive underneath the, the solar panels, but it won't be so high that it would cover the solar panels. Uh, and this is an established practice. Uh, we are talking with folks and are willing to consider, you know, having, you know, some areas that might be grass or clover uh, and bringing sheep on the site. And I understand there's some folk with sheep in the area and we'd be happy to have those discussions. Um, and we understand, you know, everybody says, you know, or to the gentleman who said he'd like no herbicides, um, you know, at this point, you know, we do the best we can. Uh, but it, you don't need herbicides for a pollinator uh, habitat. And, you know, my final point is I, I don't, you know, my understanding talking to uh, a lot of farmers and we lease and uh, land from a lot of farmers, uh, over in, in New York and in other states um, and, and in Vermont is that um, the pollinator habitat and bringing more pollinators in can be very good for agriculture. And it's actually, a ha pollinator habitat is a threatened resource in most of the Northeast. So some comments have been, oh, you might disrupt the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly is gonna be all over the place. So, um, you know, you can take us to task on that. I have a member of my team that's on the Maryland board of, you know, ground cover, you know, establishing ground cover as a prerequisite uh, native ground cover and pollinator in the state of Maryland. Uh, we've put a lot of time into this and um, happy to share that knowledge and also to learn from you what you think native uh, habitat would work best. Thank you very much. Is there anybody on Zoom that would like to speak? Okay. Ma'am, if you'd like to come forward, please. Thank you for allowing public comment tonight. My name is Jennifer Buttle and I'm a Shaftesbury resident of, I think 24 years, I could be off. Um, 
one of the reasons that I am happy to be a Shaftesbury resident is because we have a rural community. That rural community consists of farms, homes, natural views, filled with wildlife, and it is not consumed with industrial locations. Um, I am, however, a solar supporter of small-scale solar energy. I am not a supporter of this project. I would like to believe that the public um, representation has our public interest in mind, but there are some serious concerns. Some of the um, proposed site is on a north-facing slope. I don't know how many of us were born yesterday, but a north-facing slope for solar in Vermont doesn't make any sense. Also, those, the north-facing slope is what faces most of the residential places that can be seen for the proposed site. So to modify or to work together, perhaps considering changing some of the locations of where the panels are gonna be and removing the north-facing panels, removing them off of the wetlands, that might make it a little bit more palatable for some of the people saying, heck no, right now. Um, also, I have a lot of concerns and questions, and I hope that in the public um, state level reviews, I look forward to an Act 250 because I really believe that that is supposed to be there to protect the neighbors of these kinds of large scale um, projects in Vermont but I hope that there's an Act 250 review that includes wildlife and um, other impacts. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Is, is there anybody on Zoom that would like to speak? Okay. Sir, if you'd like to come forward. Hello, thank you. Um, Marcus Jones, uh, landowner in Shaftesbury. I'm going to start with a, I have three questions ultimately for Jim Porter and Eric Guzman. Um, start with a quick uh, definition quirk first of appropriate technology is suitable for the cultural, economic, and environmental context in which they are employed. The choice of technology should be driven by the needs and resources of the communities it serves rather than by the commercial interest of technology providers. The goal of appropriate technology is to create sustainable solutions that improve quality of life for people in a given community without causing the harm to environment or exacerbating social and economic equalities. In 248b2, one of the requirements is, is required to meet the present future demand for service which could not otherwise be provided in a more effective manner than conservation, energy efficiency, and load management. How is this determined, and is photovoltaics the appropriate technology in this case? Um, that's the first question. Second question in 248B4, will this result in economic benefit to the state and residents? Just an explanation of how that benefits the state, this project. Uh, and the third question is, the Department of Public Service heavily regulates the utilities in the state. They undergo rigorous oversight um, on a yearly basis to ensure that the ratepayer's best interest is being met. What evaluations have been done of the past two plus or two megawatt or larger arrays in the state to verify that concerns raised by citizens during the project process were met? Those are my three questions. Thank you. Jim or Eric, could you respond to some of those questions, please? Sure. I'm, I'm going to go first, and because Eric's memory is better than my time to get of the first one. Um, um, the question regarding economic benefit, um, the analysis is a little different for a merchant plant. There was reference made to the regulation over the, the more re rate-regulated electric utilities. And those, um, we are very concerned about any project that they construct as to whether the ratepayers would suffer any potential harm from that. As I say, it's a little different in the, um, the realm of a merchant plant like this one would be. 
Um, and I'm, Eric, did you, did, did you catch the other question? Um, I, I actually might need a refresher on the uh, uh, two remaining questions there, but um, on the first question with respect to uh, need for uh, present future demand um, in, in service, um, that, that is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the economic benefits of the state is so that's the question. Um, you know, there, there are several factors. Um, you know, we, the department has both the finance and planning division that does uh, conduct a review under that criteria. Um, you know, the, depending, it varies depending on the project, but um, you know, certain aspects of the project's uh, contribution to the state um, could be, for example, uh, I think as mentioned earlier, um, the taxes paid um, as a result of the project or the use of um, consultants and employees from the state uh, to create additional jobs. Um, there, there, there are um, various factors that, that come into play um, within that criteria alone, um, and that's something that the department um, has a, a staff um, within its own divisions to um, review um, the project and impact to that specific criteria. Um, and then uh, if, I, if the second um, question could uh, just briefly be summarized for me here, um, just for my own benefit. Yeah, it's in relation to the 248B2 where it requires the um, the requirement for these projects to meet past or present and future demand for service which could not otherwise be provided in a more cost effective manner through conservation, energy efficiency, and load management. So how is that determined that this is the most appropriate technology that is, doesn't have a better alternative because I have an alternative that I believe is better? But you are not able know, to say. but I'm just yep. saying but like so there's. Now, I'm sorry, but yeah. yes, thank you very much. Right, yeah, so the, yes, the department's, um, um, once more, you know, it's finance and, and planning division um, that does um, assess that particular criteria um, as to whether the project does present a cost, uh, cost efficient um, uh, manner to, to assess the state of reaching its renewable energy goals. Um, but we currently do not use petition has not been filed yet, so we don't have um, an assessment or requisition on that particular criteria at this time, but um, you know, that, that is something that we uh, certainly do review, um, and um, in, in instances such as this would uh, likely provide a testimony from our, our, our staff to address that specific criteria. Thank you for those answers. Is there anybody? And, and I'm sorry, I think there was a Third question, there. There was yep. a third question, which was in related relation to would it be would the DPS be supportive of evaluating and going to do lessons learned of other projects that have been installed in the state to ensure that what was said during the hearings and the whole process was actually followed through and met? Right. So um, the Section Two Forty process. Um, essentially is a question of whether to issue a certificate of public good um, uh, by the commission, which is uh, essentially the permit that um, allows construction and operation of the plan. Um, in many instances, uh, facility, uh, projects are required to um, provide uh, compliance filings um, depending on you know, depending on what, what specific issues were raised um, to ensure that, that the project was built um, as, as uh, indicated in, within the proceeding itself. Um, if the project is not um, built with, within the uh, premise of the site plan, um, landscape mitigation measures, for example, or um, the testimony that was submitted, um, there is a, uh, an avenue to um, you know, seek, for example, penalties um, against uh, the, the petitioner for you know, failing to abide by those um, specific conditions of its certificate of public good or the uh, site plan and um, testimony that was, that was relied upon by the commission to um, issue its decision. Um, and in some instances, uh, we, we have sought um, penalties for failure to comply with site plans. Um, 
Uh, and so if that, you know, if a petition was granted in this instance and a CPG was issued, um, uh, we would assume that at least some compliance filings would be necessary, um, uh, depending on the issues that are raised. Um, and we would, you know, seek to ensure that, that the plans um, and evidence submitted were, were followed through um, with, with the project's construction. Thank you very much. Is there anybody on Zoom that would like to make a comment? Okay, if you'd come forward, please. That's good, I'm not the last man standing. Um, my name is Travis Buttle. I've been a resident of uh, Shaftesbury here for uh, since 1998, somewhere in there. You need to wow. come closer. Sure. It's been a long time. Um, I, uh, I too, well, we have, uh, we have solar on our house um, since 2017. One of the things that was uh, wonderful and glamorous in the sales pitch that was given to us was that it was gonna save us a lot of money and we were doing great for the environment and all those things. I wanna to touch on a few of those things. It hasn't been as great as, was, as a sales pitch it was given to us. It underproduces um, and when we talked to the company about it, they're like, oh, well, we, our initial analyses were wrong, okay? Um, the recycling thing has come up a couple times. We've heard from a local resident as well as you saying there's recycling in Europe. I don't know, a one question is, you know, what is that percentage of recycling? We all that go to the dump here know that we put all of our recycling in a place. I know from personal experience and uh, from a, my son who worked for TAM, the majority of recycling that goes on in our country doesn't go anywhere. So I would wonder what is the actual percentage of recycling that happens with this? I know it gets better over time and you say, which I learned a few things tonight, 50 years on a panel, that's great because that's not what I was told either in my sales pitch. And I keep putting sales pitch in here. We need to make sure we don't hear a sales pitch and get lulled by something that's gonna be different five years from now or a year from now when we all realize and wake up and find out that the money is gone. Um, my other point that I wanna emphasize is um, something that I experienced and have experienced for 25 years is uh, a fractionalization of our wildlife habitats. It doesn't only happen on one specific small level, like this particular project is not going to be a huge impact on the overall environment of what we're looking at on all of our wildlife species, okay? Um, that fractionalization creates a, a breakup of uh, wildlife diversity, and without wildlife diversity, meaning everything from the ants and the gnats all the way up to the moose, we need it to be not fractionalized. That happens both with fenced-in projects like this as well as neighboring. So Thank look at you. the overall mosaic is what my question Thank to you, you is. And I didn't catch the Thank VHB. You. What does that stand for? I don't, you, you said you belong with VHB. Sir, I, at the time is up. It's, it's an engineering yeah. firm. Just Google uh, VHB.com. Okay. Well, well, there's become, a lot of VHBs, so I just wanted no, to share what that means. They're really, they're really, read, the read, name of three read if you can come up to the microphone so that everybody could hear, please, and have a response to that question. Thank you. I get the same mulligan from the other guy. Can you please repeat your question? I apologize. So there was a question about the percentage of recycling. That was the question percentage that was asked. Yeah, I, I don't have an exact, um, I don't have a exact percentage recycling, but you know, what's happening in recycling in this country, if you're talking about plastics recyclings and other, you know, has very little to do with what's, you know, gonna go on with solar panels. The solar panels can be reused. Reuse is the best, as we all know, way better than recycling, and they can be reused. Uh, and we can look into and share with uh, the Planning Commission uh, feedback on the actual percentages of, of recycling. Thank you. Is there anybody on Zoom that would like to speak? Mr. Algus, if you'd like to come forward. Uh, my name is Michael Algus. I've lived on Holy Smoke Road for more than 30 years at this point. Um, 
I want to support my abutting neighbors. Uh, I think most of what I'm, I wanted to say has already been said. Um, just one, one quick thing. I think all you need to do is walk down Holy Smoke Road and, and you'll know whether you're going to see these panels or not. I mean, it's just, it's an obvious thing. You're going to see the panels. Um, the one point I want to make is Holy Smoke Road is a very fragile road. It takes a lot of maintenance. Uh, the town road crew is great. They keep it, they keep it in shape. But uh, a big storm, a big snow, the road always needs work. So I think a lot of, a lot of trucks, a lot of industry coming up and down that road is not going to be good. And I understand you're, you're looking to have something off of seven. That might help, but I, think, I still think there's going to be a lot of traffic down that road now. And, and the road's not designed for it. So something's got to be done. I'm, I'm concerned about water runoff with that. Um, I did want to say something about the town plan, which I think didn't, doesn't have any restrictions now. I'm glad you're looking at it. I think it's really important that the, uh, the planning board and the select board uh, does give an opinion. I mean, we've heard from a number of people now that that is important, so we would look to that. And I'm hoping to see this talked about during town meeting as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Is there anybody on Zoom that's looking to speak? All right, if you'd come forward, please. Hello, um, my name is Lisa Peslich. I am a resident of Shaftesbury and have been since 1999. Um, I came to this meeting here with an open mind, trying to learn as much as possible about this uh, project that I feel is very impactful on our town. And after listening tonight, um, I really want to respect the opinions of people who seem to have some deep background uh, in engineering and other things that really are for this project because of climate change. Um, I respect solar. I have solar panels in my backyard. Um, but I'm also learning that perhaps this site was picked because of lack of regulations in our town to prevent something like this from coming here and the ability to buy the land cheaply by a big corporation, which makes it feel to me like our small town is being taken advantage of by a big corporation. I'm deeply concerned about the environmental impact of something of this scale. Um, I'm also very concerned about the nature and character of Vermont and um, especially in the impact on Studio Hill Farm, which is using ecotourism to also help save our environment. Um, and I don't feel like we should work at cross purposes to have one thing that's supposed to save our environment and our world also destroy something else that has been growing and is a beautiful thing that is trying to save our world. So I feel like it's, it, it doesn't have to be either or, like why can't we find a better site or smaller projects in places that are already environmentally compromised and not destroy something that is so beautiful the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody on Zoom that would like to speak? Is there anybody else in the audience who has not spoken once this evening that would like to speak? We'd like to thank everybody for coming and speaking and, and sharing opinions. We'd like to thank Bill, Representative David Durfee, Jim Porter, Eric Guzman, and um, Reed Wills for coming out tonight. Um, and hope that you have a good night. Thank you so much. CAT TV is celebrating 30 years of community media. Help support CAT TV's next 30 years by becoming a member today. Your membership will help us continue covering meaningful, local content. Thank you for supporting your local community media station.